Now, building up to this election, the main opposition Democratic Party of Korea had expected losses in most of the top posts. However, that one race they really wanted victory in was the former presidential candidate Lee Jae-myung's home ground, Gyeonggi-do province. Now, when there meant some silver lining after a second consecutive loss in nationwide elections, our Kim do yeon has the details. The Democratic Party of Korea have avoided crisis right at the last minute. Its Gyeonggi-do gubernatorial candidate Kim dong yeon flipped the race with less than 5% of votes left to count to finish ahead of his opponent Kim Moon-hye of the People's Power Party. The race for South Korea's most populous province of 1.3 million people was decided by just a few thousand votes. Gyeonggi-do is dubbed by some to be a miniature version of South Korea. It hosts the largest semiconductor plant in the world as well as the country's own Silicon Valley. The DP going into this election had claimed that a win here would mean that it can at least provide some checks and balances to the new Yoon administration. However, it's still a defeat in this election overall and failure in a second national election after it lost its control of the presidential office in March. The other four wins had always been expected as they were the liberal strongholds of Jeollabuk-do province, Jeollanam-do province, city of Gwangju, and Jeju Island. In the meantime, the party's former presidential candidate Lee Jae-myung made a successful comeback as he won a parliamentary by-election to replace Seoul mayoral candidate Song Young-gil. However, as a key figure in the party who took the role to oversee the election, Lee was not able to celebrate his personal win. I promise to do my best to get the people's trust back and be loved again. We were not good enough. We'll reform and show a new side of us that meets people's expectations. South Koreans again have delivered their verdict to the Democratic Party of Korea, which took 14 of the posts in the last local elections four years ago, handing them a huge blow this time around. Will the DP be able to bounce back in general elections in two years' time? That We'll have to wait and see as it will depend entirely on how the party recollects itself from post-election defeat. Kim do Arirang News. It's now time for Global Insights where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. The June 1st elections were a massive ruling party victory, except for a few traditional partisan strongholds. President Yoon's People Power Party snapped up most of the 17 mayoral and governor posts, including those um, of the country's biggest cities and regions, including Seoul, Busan, Incheon and Daegu. And at the National Assembly, former presidential candidates An cho and Lee jae won constituencies in the outskirt regions of Seoul. To break down the results and discuss the outcome, we have in the studio with us today Mason Ritchie, professor at Hangul University of Foreign Studies. Lovely to see you in our studio. And we were also joined by Ian, professor of law at the Handong International uh, Law School. Thank you so much for joining us online. Well, my first question to you, Professor Ritchie. Now, we saw a massive uh, sweeping victory for the ruling People Power Party, of course. And, well, this was seen as sort of a first indicator of what Korean people think about the new Yoon seok administration. So in that sense, what do you think this really indicates about public sentiment? Uh, so in the first place, uh, like many of these kinds of uh, you know, local and municipal and, and regional elections uh, in countries all over the world, uh, it, frequently there's a sort of halo effect uh, in these local elections that comes from <clears throat> the, uh, the national elections uh, and we're going to see something kind of similar uh, in France actually this upcoming weekend with the legislative elections following just after Macron's election and so uh, I think frequently uh, this is a sort of a first chance to see uh, you know, how the population uh, thinks that a winning presidential uh, candidate is doing in their new job. Uh, so there's this kind of halo effect, and I think in that regard what we see is that the UN administration, I think, has uh, picked up some momentum. Uh, you know, he did win a very uh, close uh, election, you know, razor-thin majority over E.J. Myung, uh, and so I think this is a sort of first confirmation that the, the overall voting public thinks he's done a relatively decent job so far. Uh, I think uh, he's getting some uh, momentum from the summit uh, with uh, President Biden. I think uh, he's uh, getting some momentum from the special budget 
that was uh, just passed. Uh, you know, looking forward, I think people are, are maybe assuming that there might be some reason to be optimistic economically uh, going forward. So I think that's on the one side. Uh, on the other side, you know, obviously the the Democratic Party uh, suffered you know very heavy losses, uh, and I think that uh, this is in part due, I think, just to uh, a sense that the public is you know kind of uh, sending the the final message to the DP that they need to reform. Uh, and that they need to, to get away from the infighting within the party uh, and that they need to, to rejuvenate uh, and, and be ready uh, to 20, in 2024 uh, and then for the next presidential election uh, in five years. Right, so maybe some time for soul searching for the DP that did suffer very heavy losses. And now um, over to you, Professor Lee. Now, I wonder what you make, what you made of the results. What do you think the results really indicate about what the South Korean people want? You know, I'd just like to echo what Professor Ritchie was saying. I think clearly uh, his last point about the Democratic Party, this really is a judgment on them in part uh, because I think in this case, it, you see you know, many years of the Moon administration and then of course Lee Jae-myung is sort of the standard bearer uh, for very progressive politics uh, with respect to Korean, Korean politics. I think the, the voters basically uh, handed the sort of the death blow to that particular form of the Democratic Party. And I think there's going to be a lot of infighting going forward because you have a younger generation, uh, famously now uh, with, within the last several weeks, of people calling out uh, the older generation in the party to sort of step down and take a younger a younger group of people to leave the party. And so I think that's one clear indication of this election. And and as, as well as I think maybe in terms of just turnout generally, there was certainly less uh, than you saw in the presidential election, which is uh, understandable, as well as in 2018. And partly probably is that that's due to voter fatigue as well. Uh, so we have a major election in March and then of course turn around the same year, which is unusual given the, the facts of the, the, the election cycle that you have this election as well. So I think all in all, it was a, a resounding victory for, for the ruling party, but against a judgment against the Democratic Party. And Professor Lee, now the Seoul mayoral race, very interesting. Um, it seemed like a no brainer really, but still even so, it was a very impressive win for Oh Tae-yeon. Um, it's going to be his fourth term as uh, Seoul mayor. And well, what do you make of the results then for the Seoul mayor race? And do you think the council seats elected will also work in O's favor? So as you mentioned, fourth term, which is unprecedented, obviously, um, that's because he had to step down uh, during his second term. And then he then came back at, about 10 years later after Park won uh, you know, uh, committed suicide. And then, of course, there was a by-election for the sole mayoral seat. And so I think this obviously will propel him to the national spotlight, uh, given, of course, it's just Seoul. Uh, but naturally, I think he becomes sort of the, the leading candidate uh, for the next presidential cycle. Uh, and so within the, I think, uh, People Power Party, uh, he probably uh, is going to sort of take the, the, the realm, helm in terms of uh, this, this uh, future direction of the party. Now, there are, of course, others in the party that will vie for that seat as well. But uh, I think it is an impressive win. Uh, and given where he had lost uh, and he had resigned, uh, basically resigned from office, uh, it's a stunning comeback. And then also just reasserting himself within the national scene as being sole mayor. Uh, and also this, in terms of what his, his, his initiatives and in going forward, I think with the Seoul City Council, I think it, he has the possibility of doing a lot uh, with respect to his term. And so uh, if he plays this well, uh, he'll put himself in the leading position then when the time comes for uh, the next presidential election. Yeah, the next presidential election. So that's what I want to ask you about, uh, Professor Ritchie. Do you, what do you think was O's appeal um, that won him a fourth uh, term in the Seoul mayoral office? And do you think this is really going to become a stepping stone for the next presidential election? Yeah, so I, I think uh, you know, his appeal uh, is probably not so much on specific policies. Uh, I think you know, for a conservative, uh, you know, he gives out a, a relatively you know, modern and contemporary and uh, sort of moderate vision uh, for uh, you know, you know, what conservatives can offer to, to Solites. Uh, I think you know, he does also get some, some credit uh, for some of the welfare policies uh, that he's backed. So I think that's probably contributed to it as well. Uh, you know, he does have some specific visions in terms of you know, trying to bring tourism back to Seoul and, and some measures in that regard. So obviously, uh, you know, those whose livelihood here in Seoul uh, depends on 
uh, on tourism, uh, you know, it depends on you know greater exchange internationally. I think are probably interested in in the vision that that he offers. Uh, you know, whether or not uh, you know this uh, mayor mayoral term for him is going to be uh, the stepping stone to the presidency uh, is, of course, a, a very interesting question. Uh, you know, historically, we know that this has often been considered the case, and I guess sort of, you know, Im Young Bak as a conservative is sort of the the paradigm, I guess, for how it is that, that you know, people look at conservatives using the, the sole uh, mayorship as a stepping stone towards uh, becoming president. Uh, but between now and uh, the next presidential uh, election cycle, you know, there's a lot of time to elapse, so he has plenty okay. of time to make progress, plenty of time to have problems. Plenty of infighting will happen within the PPP itself. There will be plenty of jockeying for position, as Professor Lee just, just mentioned. And let's not forget, too, that you know, just a few years ago, we were looking at the, the DP as ascendant and the Conservative Party as in terminal decline. And now the, the tables have totally switched. So what's going to happen in the next presidential election is, uh, is really anyone's guess. Right. So four or five years, that's... Uh centuries in political terms, I'll say. A lot can happen between now and then. And uh, my next question to you, uh, Professor Lee, moving over to the Gyeonggi-do province. Very exciting uh, morning for all of us, I'm sure. They kept us on the edge of our seats until the end, um, until we heard that Kim dong yeon of the uh, Democratic Party of Korea, that uh, he swept up the gov uh, governor post for the uh, Gyeonggi-do province region. And well, what do you think was the winning candidate's appeal? And how do you see Mr. Kim's uh, career tra trajectory going forward? Well, as you referred to, the ex exit polling showed that Kim eun was going to win the election. And so, as, right, he pulled it out the last minute. Uh, but as far as, you know, winning the Gyeonggi province election, the governorship, I mean, this was Lee Jae-myung's position, obviously. He was the governor of Gyeonggi province. And so, obviously, I think the, the DP had strong uh, a base in the Gyeonggi region. Uh, and so I think in some sense, the, the fact that it was so cl relatively that close, I think shows something about, again, a little bit about maybe Lee Jae Myung's leadership as part of the election, you know, election committee that was supposed to take the DP, the Democratic Party, sort of recover from the presidential election. But as far as, you know, it, Kim dong Yun is concerned, you know, he obviously is going to have a very bright future within the Democratic Party because uh, he came out sort of as the the, the sort of lone uh, figure, I think, outside of the strongholds for the Democratic Party. And so he's going to have the best position, I think, within the party, I think, going forward. Uh, now, Lee Jae-myung, of course, will have a, a role to play, uh, given his win in the National Assembly election. But I think this will be an interesting uh, question and issue going forward for the Democratic Party about his uh, leadership within the, the party. And then, of course, Kim Hoon-hae, uh, you know, she uh, lost this election, uh, again, very, very close. And so uh, given that it was a very close election, I, I don't see her prospects necessarily dimming per se. I think she will uh, maybe, of course, resurrect her career potentially uh, going forward. And she'll have a role to play, of course, within the People Power Party as well. But I think the, the, the dynamics have changed within the Democratic Party. And you're going to see, I think, really a new leadership uh, going forward for the Democrats. Mm, and well, Professor Lee, for Lee Jae-myung, of course, it was a pretty safe uh, electoral sort of run for him um, where he ran as he enjoyed huge popularity there while he was uh, running for president. And well, now that he's secured that National Assembly seat and as well as, as and so did An Chosu really, um, they both uh, secured their parliamentary positions. What do you think comes next for these former presidential candidates? Well, as I was talking about for Lee Jae Myung, I mean, I think he, he has an up road, I think, up uphill battle for uh, I think leadership within the party because, uh, I mean, he was the the standard bearer for the party in the presidential election and he lost. Uh, although, of course, it was a very razor thin uh, majority that Yoon won, but uh, he did lose. And so I think with the overall results of the, the losses in the Democratic Party, I think a lot of people are going to be doing soul searching within the party, but also soul searching with respect to the leadership. And so I think it, Lee Jae Myung faces a really tough road to climb with respect to, I think, re reclaiming leadership within the party. Now, for An Chol Su, I think his prospects are better. 
Uh, he obviously, uh, you know, clearly won his election handily, uh, but also, you know, given his position within the party as supporting Yoon in, sort of towards the end of the uh, presidential election, I he think he puts himself in a pretty good position, I think, with respect to the party, because uh, he has his own base. But also, I think uh, people will look to him as providing leadership within the party itself. And it will be very intriguing to see uh, between O, between An, between the uh, party leadership itself as to what role An will play in, in this, these new dynamics. And Professor Ritchie, as we tend to get very caught up in the, uh, you know, the infighting and just the bickering between politicians and local uh, agendas here, we tend to uh, talk about foreign residents here as perhaps an afterthought. And despite the growing number of foreign residents in South Korea who are eligible to vote in the local elections, we've seen a continuing um, decline in the turnout. And well, how do you think the foreign residents here in South Korea can be better represented? And how can we really endorse the kind of agendas and issues that they care about? Yeah, that's obviously a, a great question, and I'll you know, sort of start my answer by saying I think it's uh, great that Korea allows this possibility uh, to uh, non-citizens uh, to, to vote. I think that that's a, an important um, part of the civic democracy uh, here in this country. Um, that's balanced out by the other hand, uh, on the other hand, by a, a small story I can tell you from someone I was speaking with just a few days ago, actually, in the context of this election, and she said, um, uh, there's a sort of vision or a sort of story, uh, I think it might have come from a movie where she said, you know, K Koreans uh, often look at immigrants here in Korea as arriving at the table with a spoon and want to eat the meal that the Koreans have already prepared. Uh, and so there's a sense, I think, that's a sort of general unwelcome uh, for certain immigrant populations here, uh, particularly ones uh, who are uh, perhaps you know, not of uh, European ethnicity, uh, or, you know, ones who perhaps don't have higher paying jobs. Uh, so I think that a sort of you know, increase in the, the understanding on Koreans in general that you know, immigration is important for this country economically moving forward, uh, that uh, immigrants are, uh, uh, shouldn't just have a, a, a one-way street towards uh, integration into Korean society, but Koreans need to come the other way too. I think that would make a difference in a sort of more general sense of welcome for immigrants here. And I think that's an important first step. Beyond that, with specific respect to elections, frankly speaking, better communications. I mean, even for Koreans, again, talking with this Korean person I know yesterday, a few days ago, you know, she said that you know, they get you know, big thick packets of, of very detailed information about all the candidates. And it's just hard to figure out you know, who stands for what and what the actual policy platforms are and to what extent does it even matter, uh, these elections, given that so much here is decided you know, on a national level and through the central government. Uh, so I think you know, cutting through some of the complexity on, on that I think would help a lot, uh, not only with, uh, with immigrants here, but also with Koreans <laughs> uh, and getting higher turnout. Uh, and then I think the, the last thing is, you know, perhaps in some places, you know, targeted advertising, you know, to certain immigrant populations, perhaps with, you know, facing language editions of some of these pamphlets, you know, easier versions of it to understand where you have a Korean version and then a, an English version or a Chinese version or, a, you know, a version of a language from Southeast Asia or somewhere like that. I think that might help uh, as well. All right, and there's definitely been uh, growing calls for the Immigration Office, the Ministry of Law, to really uh, look at this um, immigration issue with, in, from a very multifaceted approach rather than just a one-way sort of approach, as you just mentioned. And Well, in terms of turnout, though, uh, Professor Lee, the turnout for the local elections this year was actually very low. It was um, much lower than the last race in 2018, and it was the second lowest rate um, on record for local elections. So what do you think really explains this phenomenon? Why weren't people getting out and voting? Well, I think because we had the usual situation of, you know, we had a presidential election already in March. And so I think given this, the, the attention that was paid on the presidential election, uh, you know, just several months later having th these elections, I think it leads to some, some, I think, sense from among voters you know, as to, you know, you know, coming out again to, to make this vote. Uh, but also, I think you know, beyond just that issue of just tur low turnout, yeah, I think it has to also do probably with, you know, a statement with respect to the parties themselves. With respect to, you know, the Democratic Party, again, uh, you know, I think some people may have sat out this election uh, sort of as a means to just communicate their sort of overall dismay as to, you know, where the party is going. Uh, because, you know, as we saw in the presidential election, the, 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 the populace was pretty evenly split 
between conservatives and, and progressives. And so I think you, you have to think that, you know, if certainly if the progressives were able to get more voters out into the voting booth, they made it may have seen greater success. But probably also as well, uh, that is, I think, as Professor Ritchie mentioned earlier in the broadcast, uh, the halo effect and sort of the momentum that was built by the, the People Power Party. And I think uh, the, you know, the turnout itself, I think, is a reflection of sort of maybe giving this administration, the UN administration, its mandate to sort of go forward, uh, you know, knowing that there's a significant population that is maybe uh, wary of his policies, but a, a general hope and, and willingness to sort of think about the future and be a little more optimistic. Well, I'm afraid this is where we're going to have to wrap up this interview. That was Ian, uh, Professor of Law at Handong International Law School. Thank you for joining us all the way from Poang online. And Mason Ritchie, Professor at Hangul University of Foreign Studies. Thank you so much for being in studio with us today. Thanks for having me. Korea's experience in Hakon 2019 and introduced a Korean new yeah. Korean survivor of Japan's wartime sex slavery met with the ordinary climate crisis and pledged to work with the EU to tackle the challenge. The objective of its North Korea policy is protesters gathering across the country to peacefully demand an end to hate and violence. Arika, what matters? And welcome back to the second half of New Day at Arirang. Now, U.S. Special Envoy Sung Kim is due to arrive here in Seoul on Thursday for talks on North Korea with his South Korean and Japanese counterparts, Kim Gun and Takahiro Funakoshi. The U.S. State Department announced Wednesday that the three sides will discuss a variety of North Korea issues, including the North's latest ICBM launches, as well as a response to the COVID-19 situation in the regime. The department added that Kim's three-day visit to South Korea will stress close cooperation between Seoul, Washington and Tokyo to achieve complete denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. The upcoming trilateral meeting will mark the first of its kind since Kim Gon took office. The World Health Organization has cast doubt over North Korea's claim that its COVID-19 situation is getting better. WHO Executive Director for Health Emergencies Dr. Mike Ryan said on Wednesday that the situation there is in fact worsening. The WHO says it has provided three rounds of vaccine aid to the North and is continuing to do so. 
According to the North, the number of COVID-19 cases has been in the 100,000 range for the past three days, a huge drop from the nearly 400,000 cases a day that the regime reported a few weeks ago. South Korea has also said Pyongyang's reporting appears to be aimed at boosting internal unity. The U.S. Federal Reserve says a majority of the country's 12 districts recently experienced slight or modest economic growth. Now, according to the Fed's Beige Book, four districts explicitly noted that the pace of growth had slowed in the period prior. The slower growth comes as retail contacts notice softening as consumers face higher prices, while residential real estate contacts observed high prices and rising interest rates. The report, based on anecdotal evidence collected by the Fed's 12 regional banks through the months of April and May, will be used as base material for the upcoming rate-setting Federal Open Market Committee meeting slated for later this month. Now, the nation's exports rose 21.3 percent on year in May, fueled mainly by chips and petroleum products. According to Trade Ministry data, outbound shipments stood at over 61 billion U.S. dollars uh, from some 50 billion a year earlier. It's the highest May figure since related data was first compiled in 1956. Also, the second largest ever monthly figure next to the one set in March 2022. Now, experts also posted double digit growth for 15 straight months. However, High global energy prices amid the Ukraine crisis pushed up Seoul's imports, leading to a trade deficit for the second consecutive month in May. Inbound shipments jumped 32 percent on year to over $63 billion, leading to a trade deficit of some $1.7 billion. Now, as South Korea is heavily dependent on imports for most energy needs, related imports spiked over 84 percent on year. And it's time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deeper into some of the key issues in the spotlight right now. A number of South Korean conglomerates are investing heavily in next-gen businesses such as semiconductors and batteries. The move is all the more important as globally there is a massive shortage of semiconductor chips and a high demand for batteries. And more car makers are pushing towards the EV market. To get a look into South Korea's investments, we connect with Oh Jun Suk, Professor at the School of Business at Sungyeong Women's University. Very good morning to you, Professor. And well, first off, what's your take on a number of South Korean conglomerates really investing very heavily in next-gen businesses? Do you think this is on par with President Yoon suk push for private-led economic growth? Uh, thank you for that, King Su Yang. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Yoon government keeps signaling for private-led economic growth, uh, and the industry announced the investment plans uh, as a positive response for the private-led economic growth. Uh, Korean jewel like Samsung, SK, LG, Hyundai Motors, Lotte, Posker are pledged to invest a combined 870 billion US dollars over the next five years. What's outstanding more than anything else is investment strategies and investment style has become different. Uh, even until the early 20s, uh, catch-up strategies were the central business gravity, and then investment style were classified as totally risk averse. But uh, now uh, it is different. As the business status and environments uh, in the market has changed, uh, second rate has no place on the global stage. Korean conglomerates uh, make a bet on game changer, uh, taking risks to create opportunity in the future. Uh, for example, three areas are most outstanding. First, AI chips are key to a future semiconductor market dominance for Korean companies. Uh, they are designed for a wide variety of functions uh, as voice recognition, autonomous driving, and metaverse uh, Internet of Things. Secondly, conglomerates recently massive investment in the bio uh, biofield reflex uh, their confidence in medicinal production. And lastly, robustness is secondary battery uh, supply chain. Uh, Postco Group is building a secondary battery material supply chain in line with the launch of Postco Holdings quite recently. Uh, it has prepared a stable source of uh, raw materials by receiving long-term supply of lithium from uh, Australian uh, Pilbara Minerals. So uh, let's talk about the battery sectors because these South Korean conglomerates like SK, LG, mm. and Samsung SDI, I mean, they're taking their money into the battery sector. 
With this massive investment into the sector, how big do you think South Korea's share of the global battery market will be uh, moving forward? Uh, it has huge potentiality. In addition to the country's uh, strong position in memory chips, uh, Korean conglomerates have paid attention on the battery sector. Uh, as you mentioned, it is very critical for uh, EV competitiveness. The combined global market share with three major Korean battery makers uh, fell slightly this year amid the toppling competition with uh, bigger Chinese rivals. Uh, the uh, cumulative market share of LG Energy Solution, SK Innovation, uh, now uh, name changes to SK On, and Samsung SDI to the 33.8%, LG Energy Solution, which supplies electric vehicle batteries uh, to Volkswagen and Ford, ranked second with 23.8% market share. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the number one is the Chinese rival CATL, they're taking up 31.2%. Uh, Other major competitor in the market are Panasonic placed uh, with 13.3%, uh, and China's BYD followed the same 0.9%. The global battery market keeps growing, and the cumulative amount of battery energy usage from electric vehicles reached 195.4 gigawatt hours globally. Uh, uh, this amount is uh, 2.3 times higher than the previous year. It is expected Korean battery major managed to depend the com combined market share of uh, uh, average of 30% uh, in the global EV power in the face of escalating competition with Chinese uh, producers. Um, well, President Biden's recent visit to South Korea, it started with a uh, very, uh, the, his first well, in his itinerary, his first stop was the semiconductor plant in um, mm. in the uh, southern uh, south of Seoul, and well, it really showed how much the U.S. is now relying on South Korean semiconductors. And well, what's your prediction for South Korea's global role in the uh, chip sector moving forward? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the asking. During the summit meeting, uh, Korea and the uh, U.S. stress uh, cooperation in chips and battery in a joint statement suggesting for allied supply chain. Now the time, uh, uh, now is the time. Uh, technology factors uh, come to influence international politics as much as the uh, geopolitical factors uh, as in the past. Uh, U.S. has come to rely on assistance from core alliance like Korea to win over China. Uh, in its tech contest. Uh, the U.S. has realized it cannot handle the global order alone, launching Quad as a way of hemming in China. Uh, now the U.S. is working on a similar framework uh, with the U.K. and Australia, uh, so-called AUKUS, a security alliance, and the Washington tried to uh, join uh, Japan uh, to uh, the AUKUS. Uh, Korea has been on the receiving end in its relationship uh, with the U.S., but now the U.S. needs Korea, since Korea is a major producer of chips and batteries necessary to U.S. industries. Now, any troubles on the industrial front could mean trouble for the United States industry. Washington reportedly is seeking a chip for alliance with Asian chip maker countries, a memory chip of South Korea, chip equipment of Japan, and system chip of Taiwan to ensure stable production and supply chain uh, of chips, uh, which are stable uh, in modern industry. A supply chain encompasses all processes from components for manufacturing to raw materials, equipment, and even finished products. Well, I wish we had some uh, more time for this discuss discussion, but unfortunately, this is all the time that we have. Professor, I'll thank you very much for your insights this morning. And again, uh, looking forward to speaking to you. Thank you. BTS visited the White House to meet President Joe Biden on Tuesday. The session came on the last day of Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month in the States. And it was an opportunity to address the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes. Song Yujin has the details. K-pop superstars BTS visited the White House on Tuesday to meet U.S. President Joe Biden and discuss ways to combat anti-Asian hate crimes. Before their closed-door meeting with the president, the group attended a White House press briefing. 
The briefing room was packed with more journalists than usual, and more than 230,000 viewers had joined the White House's live stream before the event had even begun. So today on the final day of Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, I'm excited to welcome some special guests to the briefing room today, Pop Phenoms BTS. Taking turns on the podium, BTS started by thanking the White House and the President for the invitation. And hi, we're BTS, and it is a great honor to be invited to the White House today to discuss the important issues of anti-Asian hate crimes, Asian inclusion, and diversity. The group members moved on to stress the importance of diversity and tackling crimes targeting Asians. Crimes, including Asian American hate crimes. To put a stop to this and support this cause, we'd like to take this opportunity to speak out on the matter once again. It's not wrong to be different. Equality begins when we open up and embrace all of our differences. The group's visit to the White House comes as anti-Asian hate crimes have seen a significant surge in the U.S. A report by the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism showed that the number of such crimes last year jumped 339 percent from the year before. Song Yujin, Arirang News. Now, it's not an overstatement to say that there are cafes on every other street in South Korea, with over 70,000 cafes in the country. Well, many of those cafes provide much-needed space for millennials and Generation Z, collectively known in South Korea as the MZ generation. Lee hoo tells us more. On average, South Koreans drink 353 cups of coffee a year. That's nearly three times the global average. South Korea boasts over 70,000 cafes, which is more than the number of convenience stores in the country. And while the pandemic has hurt many industries, cafes have been booming. In fact, in 2020, the country imported a record 176,000 tons of coffee, up 5.4 percent from the previous year. And in January 2021, the number of cafes had grown by 15 percent compared to the same month the year before. A significant number of the new cafes were opened by the so-called MZ generation, those born between roughly 1981 and 2005. A cafe owner who belongs to this generation shared why he thinks many of his peers dream of opening cafes. Low barriers to enter the market, the fact that you can decorate your own space and develop your own recipes and get immediate feedback from customers, as well as personal satisfaction, I think are the reasons. According to a survey conducted in 2020, over 50 percent of the MZ generation visit cafes more than once a week. I think for Korean people, it's a place where people can find rest for a moment. Studying at cafes is less stressful and more fun than in rigid environments like at home or school. Experts say that for young people, cafes provide a place of independence. For the MZ generation, their own space within the house is very limited and their friends also have no space of their own. So to maintain social relationships, talk to each other and to do activities independently, they have to go outside the house. And the closest place they can access their own space are cafes. Cafes are more than just a place to buy coffee, especially for young South Koreans. Lee si Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. An earthquake in China's southwestern province of Sichuan has killed at least four people and injured 14 others. The 6.1 magnitude earthquake hit Lushan County in Ya'an City on Wednesday at 5 p.m. local time. Local authorities also reported that another earthquake measuring at 4.5 rattled neighboring Baoxing County. Officials said over 1,400 firefighters have been dispatched to affected areas, with damage to homes reported in Lushan County. Following the two quakes, China's railway authority halted train services in the area. Denmark will join the EU's common defense policy after Danes voted on Wednesday in favor of joining. 
According to an exit poll by Danish outlet TV2 on Wednesday, 66.6% were in favor of ending the country's 30-year-old opt-out. The referendum is the latest example of a European country seeking closer defense links with allies in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Abandoning the opt-out will mean that Danish officials can participate in EU defense topic discussions, and Danish forces can also take part in EU military operations. On Wednesday, eight school buses parked in Lviv Central Square with empty seats to serve as a reminder of the 243 children killed since Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine on February 24th. Some of the seats were occupied by stuffed toys and children's name tags and marked a commemorative event for Ukraine's Children's Day. Kyiv has accused Moscow of atrocities against civilians during its invasion, adding on Tuesday that it has identified more than 600 Russian war crime suspects and started prosecuting roughly 80 of them. Russia, meanwhile, has denied targeting civilians and war crime allegations and has instead accused Kyiv of staging them to smear its forces. A new sport that mixes elements of tennis, badminton and ping-pong is fast gaining popularity in the United States. Called pickleball, the sport started in 1965 in Washington state when three dads created a game the whole family could play. They named the sport after one of their dogs, Pickles. Figures show that the U.S. alone has 4.8 million active players, double from just a few years ago. A key selling point of pickleball is its low cost and ease of playing, as four courts can fit in the same space as one tennis court. It only requires a net, a paddle and a perforated plastic ball. According to USA Pickleball, the sport is also getting younger, with growth among players under 55 skyrocketing. Three young white lions have found a new home at Venezuela's Caricuao Zoo. Originally from South Africa, the lions arrived last week from a zoo in the Czech Republic and are part of efforts to improve zoos and parks across the South American country. The trio is comprised of one female and two males. They are all roughly two years old and each weigh 120 kilograms. The lions will remain in a quarantine facility at the zoo in the Venezuelan capital Caracas until the end of June and will then be relocated to a bigger enclosure where tourists can see them. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good morning. Well, we can all feel that the sizzling summer heat is right around the corner. Afternoon highs in Seoul will be slightly lower, but southern provinces, especially Gyeongsangdo provinces, will have highs that are in the low 30s. And along with the heat, a dry air advisory has been issued for Gyeongsangdo provinces, with the air getting drier each day. And also very strong UV rays are expected for most parts of the country again, so don't forget to apply a good amount of sunblock. At least mornings and evenings are quite comfortable. Morning lows are similar to yesterday, kicking off in the low to upper teens. Then highs in Daegu should go up to 33 degrees Celsius this afternoon. Gwangju topping out at 30 degrees under mostly sunny skies with decent air quality nationwide all day. Then notice how hot it's going to be on Friday with an expected high of 32 degrees Celsius here in Seoul. But temperatures will return to normal next week. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe.
And that wraps up our newscast for this hour, but we'll be back tomorrow for our Friday's edition of New Day at Arirang. Thanks ever so much for tuning in. We also have more updates throughout the day. Have a great rest, uh, great rest of your day wherever you are. Goodbye.